we have some welcoming remarks. We have welcoming remarks online from uh, Christiana Schumer, who is head of International Fora and Organizations Group at the International Bureau of the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And as we've already heard, uh, they are the main donor of the Climate Resilience Initiative and indeed the summit. It is a great pleasure to come together on this pleasant summer morning in person or online, as you can see, at the UNU's Flood Knowledge Summit 2022 from Risk to Resilience. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all on behalf of the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. <clears throat> One year after the devastating flood, the summit is a good opportunity to take a moment to reflect and to look ahead. The region and its people still suffer from damages caused by the flood. Reconstruction has to be climate resilient in order to prevent future flood disasters. Nevertheless, transformation needs to take place in close cooperation with the local people to gain their acceptance. These are challenges, challenging processes. The flood showed the force of climate change in action right at our doorstep. However, many more incidents, which have already been mentioned today, recently in Australia, take place all over the world. And I would like to recommend the UNU EHS report on interconnected disaster risks to get some more information on this. It's time to act. Over the last two decades, the Federal Ministry has invested under the FONA framework program more than 5 billion euros in research for sustainable development. Last year, additional projects were established that investigate how local communities can protect themselves against the impacts of extreme weather events. For example, the project HOVAS, how governance and communication in the flood crisis of July 2021 aims to improve flood warnings and the evacuation of areas affected by extreme weather events. By now, their first results and they, are, they defined five factors for flood risks, which I would like to mention here now. Processes in the atmosphere, runoff formation in the landscape, processes in the river, exposure, and susceptibility. Moreover, the federal ministry has many long-term funding schemes from which I will mention two now. First, climate resilience through action in the city and region aims to contribute to the management of regional challenges due to climate change through transdisciplinary and needs-oriented research. Second, regional information on climate action aims to provide answers to the questions which specific climate change can, expected in my, can be expected in my region, what adaptation measures are necessary and useful. In addition, for many years, the Federal Ministry funds the United Nations University in Germany, especially the Institute for Environment and Human Security, UNU, EHS in Bonn. Therefore, we gladly supported the United Nations University Climate Resilience Initiative. The common initiative of UNU, EHS in Bonn, UNU Krisch in Bruges, and UNU Merit in Maastricht is an ideal platform from my point of view to share knowledge in the region and beyond, shape policy and drive action. Only together, we can learn from the experiences of our European and global partners, which I again would like to welcome here on this platform and develop common measures for the transformation of affected areas. Research as the driving force for change is more important than ever. Also in the challenging time, times that we are facing at the moment, we need innovative research with interdisciplinary and systemic approaches. In addition to the natural and engineering sciences, we need the involvement of social sciences as well as research on governance and transformation. The voice of science and decisions taken on scientific basis are essential to reach and further develop the sustainable development goals. The UNU is a key player and has to be a key play player to transfer scientific knowledge into policy measures and action. Therefore, I would like to thank the UNU and especially UNU Merit as the host of the conference 
and all participating research institutions for this initiative and the organization of the event. Let's exchange knowledge and ideas in order to shape a more resilient society of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And I think we definitely hear your call specifically on driving action and for innovative research. And we now have a keynote address uh, from uh, Dr. Martin Rutten, who is Associate Professor of Water Management at TU Delft. And I'm going to hand over to Saskia Werners, uh, who is Head of Vulnerability Assessment, Risk Management, and Adaptive Planning at UNUEHS. So while you are scanning, and I should not stand in front, uh, I will introduce myself. Um, I'm Martin Rutten. Uh, I work uh, as an Associate Professor of Water Management and Climate Adaptation at the Delft University of Technology. And actually, until uh, one year ago, I was mainly working on deltas. So deltas in Vietnam, in Myanmar, and also in the Netherlands. And I was working uh, on these deltas, mainly with transdisciplinary groups of students. So students from different disciplines. And transdisciplinary, I would say, because I was also very much stimulating them to interact with communities, to interact with uh, practice. As I was also working as a professor at the University of Applied Science, so Fachhochschule. Um, yes, can I go to the next slide? Let's see if this works as well. No. Then, hmm. I'm not entirely sure which one. Yes. Yeah, now it does. Maybe okay, this one works too. Um, and the um, floods of last year basically brought me back to my roots because on the uh, picture you see me with my grandmother and my father. I think almost 40 years ago, somewhere I made a villa or Weiden, as we say in uh, Dutch, uh, because my grandmother was from this region, actually from Maastricht to the station. And then um, uh, almost a year ago, uh, Professor Bart Jungmann, who was um, part of the task force of Estonia that visited this region quickly after the floods, asked me, uh, would you like to start up a student thematic working groups on the floods that uh, happened last year? Because I'm anticipating that many of students want to contribute, and I think we should coordinate that. We should organize an effective network to support uh, really our insights on uh, flood resilience in this region. So that's what we started off with. And this poster was kindly prepared by uh, one of my student assistants, Anu, who is also in the audience together with a couple of other TAs. And an overview of our work uh, is in the of the website that we also just launched this week. So I'm happy that we managed that. Today I will touch upon some of these results, but I mainly will discuss a broader perspective on uh, flood resilience. I was asked by the organization also to have a look at the most recent IPCC insights on that. And uh, I would like to take uh, during my talk, give us all the opportunity to reflect on what we learned last year, but also uh, particularly on what we would like to learn in the coming days year and maybe five years to start because i think one of the previous speaker was also discussing about this window of opportunity that is now open to do something but that will also quite quickly narrow again and here it will maybe narrow because we are losing maybe the our yeah we are we don't see it as much urgent anymore but also, it will also narrow, as the IPCC points out in their sixth assessment report, it will also narrow because climate change is progressing and we have limited time to act for mitigation and adaptation. Okay, then we can go to no, the it next. Works. No, it works. Great. Um, so this is the first test case, uh, see if many people works. Uh, so my question is, uh, so I am mainly working on uh, this area, but I'm wondering where the audience is working most on. See if we see some dots appearing. Ah, great, it works. I'm happy. I see India, I see South America popping up. <laughs> A big dot in Europe. The US. Hmm. 
More spread. No one on the floods in Australia? It was just mentioned, but I see no dots there yet. Oh, yeah, yeah, great. Right. We have one. <laughs> Then the next question to get to know the audience a little bit better is um, the main sector of your main occupation. So I understand we have a mixture here of academia and other sectors. Let's see how that mixture looks like. Okay, we do have a mix, but I think during the sessions in the coming weeks, we have to make sure that we have equal representation in the perspectives that are brought forward, uh, I think. Um, then uh, the next thing, um, because uh, I can see and you can learn from each other from the screen what type of people are there, but I would like you to take two minutes uh, to discuss with someone you don't know yet, so maybe also someone sitting behind or in front of you, to uh, take some time to discuss the most important thing you learned of the last year uh, and your most important contribution to flood resilience over the last year. So please take two minutes to introduce you to someone you don't know yet and discuss it. <laughs> From uh, did these are built five years ago, but now I don't know you, so maybe I'll discuss. Yeah, all right. Yes. Continue over coming days, but I only have half an hour, so I'm <laughs> going. 
Um, but uh, just um, okay. No, yeah, I have a little concern that I. I think uh, it's still a countdown. Oh, okay, so I have to keep talking. Uh, but I think we can already prepare. Because yeah, you so, but we need to go to the next slide for that yeah. one. Uh, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. That, that's, I think you have to click on the presentation and then I can click. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. So I uh, guess uh, to learn again from you. Uh, your yeah. most important okay, lesson learned. In best falls in which category? Yeah, probably there are other categories as well, but please try to specify which category is the most important. It's being recorded. Interesting. Uh, what I was very uh, interested in is that, uh, so my background is civil engineering, so I'm mostly working on biophysical uh, system understanding, but already yesterday during dinner, I found myself uh, one of the only uh, uh, civil engineers at the table uh, that for a conference about philosophy, that was for me very exceptional. But I'm also very, uh, yeah, very excited about that to be a little bit uh, in a, a minority in this audience. That's really nice. Yeah, I see a lot of things. Okay. So you know how we can hear Yeah, I yeah, can yeah, completely <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> yeah. So are the people all from the breakout rooms yeah. are also back, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So a lot of the insights here were from the socioeconomic system understanding, and I'm really curious to learn more about that during the course of this conference. Um, then there's again, I need to take this, yes. Okay, and then the contributions that you made over the last years, would you say that it's mainly knowledge development? Uh, would that also be a change of attitudes of the people that have to act? Do you think, okay, no, I already uh, achieved something that is more towards intention to implement, or did I already change behavior or really change something on the ground? Where do our contributions lie so far? Okay. I'm happy to see also dots on the on your right hand side. So it's nice. And then let's hope that over the coming five years we can move more of these dots also to get a more balanced perspective uh, here. Um, maybe if someone uh, can start operating the waiting room, then that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, I think they do from the other. Okay, great. great. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay. But I don't, yeah, that don't find so now um, we move to the facts about floods. Uh, I was asked by the organizers to um, uh, you, uh, yeah, bring also some of the insights from the last assessment report by the IPCC. And according to that one, so that was prior to the floods that happened last year, most of the documentation was written. How much have floods increased over the periods from 1985 till 2016? Yeah. And actually, this kind of nicely reflects the uncertainty range that we're talking about. So some of the statements regarding this frequency from the IPCC report uh, are listed here on the slide. And there are a couple of things. That is, for one, this wide uncertainty range. The other thing is that uh, the geographic uh, variety, right? So We've seen uh, 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 increase uh, fourfold in the tropics and northern mid latitude much less. Um, but what I think is also very important to bear in mind when we're discussing floods and when we're discussing uh, resilience is that it's not only about floods, it's also about droughts. And particularly in this region, for example, here in Maastricht, before. Uh, the uh, floods happened last year, we experienced at least four years of severe droughts and we're 
entering into one not currently again. So it's something to bear in mind as well. And especially because also the heavy um, fatalities due to droughts are uh, uh, just as severe as during the floods and slow killing, also in Europe. And then the next one, uh, the cost of damage. So when we're looking at the consequences, how much will uh, more people will be affected if we are heading on that three degrees pathway, which uh, at least in the Dutch newspaper was uh, still uh, quite a large probability. Yeah. We're on the higher end, factor three to four. This is what the IPCC 6 assessment report says about that. Actually, they are for this region quite modest. About uh, three degrees will make double. So I thought, okay, that's not that bad. But then again, this geographical spread of the place. So, for example, uh, the effects in South America, the lower uh, uh, bullets are much more severe. And what I think also comes out forward from these type of statements is that we cannot easily put a monetary value to everything, right? Displaced people or the number of people affected. It's not only about the losses in economic terms, and it's very much uh, deviated among, uh, very much different among countries. Um, this is, uh, again, um, a table from the IPCC report, which reflects, again, this uh, spatial variability in how the region is affected, and also on a much wider range of uh, impacts that climate uh, change has. Then, moving uh, to this uh, region. So, uh, this was uh, a picture that you probably have seen quite a lot over the last years. This was presentation as it fell next week, a year ago, uh, with a large variability, which a big red center close uh, to this area. And um, we have looked at uh, when you are talking about climate change. We have looked if we assume stationarity, so the climate is not changing, what would have been uh, the return period for, in this case, the curl catchment of a 20, uh, 48 hour return period. This was done by one of my students. And already on this quite small catchment, you see a lot of variability, but you also see that some of these. Um, uh, presentation events had return periods for once every 250 years. And if you then know that the city of Valkenburg, for example, the flood defense system was prepared for a once in a 25 year event, you can imagine uh, that uh, actually they were still quite lucky for what happened uh, there. But this is uh, assuming uh, that uh, we are still uh, not under climate change condition when it comes to rainfall. Uh, another student uh, that I'm working with, Athanasios, uh, he has looked at uh, trends in presentation. And what he found, and what also other researchers found, is that there are significant increases in extreme precipitation, particularly in summer in this region. And I was yesterday pointed out to a documentary that was on German television where even up to 90 fold increases were mentioned. I don't, didn't check it yet, but that was also one of the figures that was mentioned. So we do see that uh, climate change is uh, also in this region driving uh, the increase in flood risk. Yet, um, it's not the only driver to uh, flood risk. And I think when we are thinking about intervening, when designing solutions, when thinking of adaptation or recovery pathways, it is important to understand uh, what uh, the drivers are, how strong they are, how much effect they have, but also particularly how uncertain they are. So what are the most uncertain effects we need to prepare for? 
And this one I did not try yet on many meters, so I'm very curious if it works. So what I would like you to ask you to do is basically place the driver, so the transportation due to climate change, land use, hydrogeology, and uh, geopolitics somewhere on the slides. And um, also start thinking about important drivers that I missed, because that will be the question that will pop up on the next slide. So please put the driver somewhere on the screen. So how much impact do you think they have when it comes to blood risk and how uncertain they are? And think about other drivers that I might have missed. They're all equally important. This may scenario development is very hard if you think about it like this, but anyway. <laughs> so now at least we have to make a four by four matrix of scenarios, which is typically uh, quite a difficult exercise. But anyway. Okay. Now, which factors were missing? What do you think is very important and uh, was missing on the previous slide? So, in addition to climate change, land use, geopolitics, the local geological situation, what is very important? What should we consider? See the human dimension popping up, awareness, preparedness, consumption also interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, a little more real. Yeah. Nice, I will have to uh, get some students organized to organize and rank this, but thanks. <laughs> um, again, uh, back uh, to this, uh, this area and some results from our lab so far. Um, when it comes to the factors driving, uh, so we're, I've already discussed that uh, the precipitation and also the change in climate change has had a major factor. But if we look at the attribution of the uh, flood peak in the Gull, which is uh, here, and here you see uh, the different uh, tributaries and how much they contribute to the flood rate, uh, what we found uh, using uh, some uh, hydrogeological modeling is that there are a couple of things that were very important when we came to understand the floods that happened last year. Is for one that the um, antecedent conditions uh, played a big role, so how much moisture was already there in the, in the soil, and that actually the floods could have been up to 40% worse in the Dutch part if the whole soil had been saturated. But also it would have been less if we were under normal conditions, because we did have some severe rain events also prior to this particular flood event. And the other thing when it comes to driving forces is that uh, the land use types uh, play still a big role. So it rained hard, but not that hard that on unpaved soil uh, the uh, rain would come directly downwards. There, was, there were still some delays, particularly on the more natural unpaved uh, land use sites. Um, when it comes to uh, um, what you can do, so there is certainly possibilities to do things in the landscape, to work with uh, more blue-green solutions with natural buffers. Another thing that uh, we looked at is uh, moving more to the flood early warning systems. What can be done there? 
And um, what we see is uh, the flood or water system as it functioned uh, last year can be improved in a couple of ways. For one, better rainfall data. So it took quite some effort to get a good picture of what type of rain uh, happened. And this also requires some transboundary collaboration to get that better. Um, the other thing, for example, is to uh, basically uh, more quickly share discharge observations across the border. That will also uh, make the response uh, or the warnings better and the response faster, even in this small transboundary catchment of the curl. Uh, thirdly, uh, that's more the hydrodynamic modeling. So uh, is that it's important when you're uh, uh, talking about warnings and also predicting the flood wave to take the 2D effects into account. And all type of this type of actions will help us to more quickly evacuate or also more quickly work with uh, flood uh, barriers. This is an example of a test we did together with the water board in who wants to see if we can with more, uh, with alternatives to sound packs, if we can respond more quickly. Um, another thing uh, that is uh, uh, important to take into account are the more measures that the local house owners can uh, take. And one other student, he investigated how much would flood risk reduce with wet and dry clothing. Although this morning I also had an interesting chat with one of the people here present at the conference and he said yeah after the last floods uh everyone starts flood putting their house up to 20 centimeters because that was the last flood and then all of a sudden it was a couple of meters so we didn't help at all so here it's also important like what what i what is the flood level that you're preparing for and another takeaway i think from the spatial planning perspective is also really really careful consider where you want to build and what are appropriate areas uh, to build. But there is a lot of potential here, but there's also some kind of reluctancy to communicate this type of uh, interventions because people are also afraid to communicate which houses are particularly at risk in terms of housing prices. But that is also a tight balance and a discussion we also need to have with, for example, insurance companies. Um, so Basically, uh, what uh, I would like to do in the coming uh, one to five years is get more understanding on how all these interventions can act uh, together, because we're working in one landscape, in one water system, uh, and how can these interventions, so investing more in buffers uh, in the natural environment, investing more in buffering capacity in the built environment, in the streets, in the paved area, uh, looking more at regenerative farming, what that can do for uh, getting more sponges in uh, the system, but also looking at what can we do operationally in spatial planning. And I think one of the challenges is to bring this all together and then also to top this up with a functioning governance system as well. So that's the thing I would uh, like to work on in the coming five years and what I'm also looking for collaboration. But I would like, before I close, um, I would like to ask the audience if I am looking at, um, uh, I, can I still have 10 minutes, is that okay? Five to six. Five to six, yeah, okay, that's okay. So still, I will, I will give you a couple of minutes. Uh, so because this was basically uh, also one of the pictures from the sixth assessment report where the pathways are sketched, right? And so I would like to do what I previously described on, on the slide to embark on this green pathway. But I'm curious to learn what you would like to contribute to that pathway. So, um, Again, so it's uh, four minutes because I need one minute to close off after uh, to discuss with someone else in the audience uh, what would you like to learn about contributing to flood resilience in the coming two year, today's year, five, uh, five years, and what do you need for that, and who do you need for that? So please find someone you haven't spoken to yet and take three to four minutes to discuss this. Yes. 
So the nice thing about being able to deliver a keynote is that you were only able to share your request with a couple of people. I can share it for the whole audience, and I would like to make use of that to find out my talk. So basically, what I'm looking for is from both uh, the practitioner side, as from the UN side, as from other organizations present here today, are programs that they think they would benefit from critical students. So I work with master students, I work with PhD, with bachelor students, even would like to work with students from vocational education. Please bring me from. <laughs> the second thing is that so our lab works uh, on a lot of areas uh, with climate adaptation on thematic working groups, and um, we are open to students also from other uh, universities as well, although we're still quite self dominated. So I would like to reduce that self dominance. So please, if you have a student that you think, oh, they would like to work in such a thematic working group, or maybe we can set up a satellite group at uh, our university and get an uh, organized collaboration through that way, I would be very interesting. And I think it's nice to invest in that because I think that is really our young network of people that needs to um, address these transdisciplinary challenges in the, the coming decades. And the earlier we connect them with each other, I think uh, the better and more effective we can make use of that. Um, more particular in this region, I'm looking for partners to develop field and test sites because um, I didn't stress that too much, but I think particularly when it comes to understanding better the buffering or the buffering or sponge capacity in this landscape, we can modeling, keep modeling, 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 but I think we need to start more measuring that. So um, if there are people that say, okay, I have a piece of land and property and I would be happy to work with you on that, great. Uh, and uh, the thing, uh, I didn't put it on slides, but who would classify themselves as a part of the creative sector or uh, art or designer? Yeah, so I think I think it's also interesting to see how, how can we better integrate them in our community and create these perspectives that we, we need uh, on our landscape. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, close. Uh, my contact details are here on the slide, and um, I'm looking forward to a very interesting uh, conference and to meet many of you today. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Saskia. That was really uh, interesting, enlightening, and I think your last point there is critical. It's, uh, and we have touched on it um, earlier on the multidisciplinary cross-border element of this, but there are so many industries and individuals um, who need to be involved in, if we're to find proper solutions. We now have the plenary session. We have two speakers online, two speakers in the room. I'm going to ask Patrick and Anne to come up and take a seat and um, grab a microphone. The title of this session is The Water Will Come risk perception and community preparedness. And I think we know already that the water is here. Um, our speakers uh, for this session are, uh, on my left, we have Patrick van der Broek, who is chairman of Watershap in Limburg, here in the Netherlands. We have Anne Vrelst, who is a psychosocial manager for the Belgian government. And online, we are joined by Dr. Martin Schiffar, who is a leading medical doctor in the Ar Valley in Germany, and Cornelia Weigand, who is councilwoman uh, at Landkreis Arweiler. Apologies for my pronunciation, but good morning and welcome. Um, we're going to start with a couple of questions, and I want to try and get some questions in from the audience too in this session. But the first question um, we're going to uh, ask you about is individual risk. Um, and I'd just like to try and gather your thoughts on, you know, how individual risk perception, and this is something that Martine touched on uh, in the last few minutes of her presentation, but how individual risk 
perception could potentially enhance or undermine collective perception of these disasters of floods and perhaps other emergencies. Patrick, um, could I start with you and your thoughts uh, and your experiences, particularly for the last 12 months? Yeah, um, I will. Well, uh, when you live in the area of Falkenburg or Böhle, uh, you, uh, you don't have any warning anymore to understand that you have uh, enormous risk. But uh, what is um, special about it, um, much people built a deck which they had. So they had wood floors. So we built that wood floors instead of building cement floors. And we can discuss about the CO3 and, and, and all those things. But um, the, the, I don't know how you pronounce it in English, but the, the places where you put your elect electricity in the walls, they put them back on the uh, on the ground and not one or uh, one and a half meter higher. So that is an interesting question why people do that. I'm not a social um, and, uh, investigator. Um, uh, I, but I think that most of the people uh, do things like this because they don't uh, want to see, because they are afraid. Building back which I had to give me comfort. That is what I'm used to. And people are perhaps afraid of looking in the future and, uh, and act in the future. And I think also, um, especially for the Dutch people, we have a very, uh, we are very uh, confident about uh, uh, water issues. We are world famous, uh, thanks to all those brilliant people from Delft, we built the best uh, water defenses in the world. We are so famous about that. And so, um, uh, water crisis are no issues. So uh, um, this was an absolute wake-up call. Also for us as a, a water authority in the province of Limburg, and just as we had also such a wake-up call in 93 and 95, because in the province of Limburg, we never uh, realized, we never thought about it, that we could have uh, um, uh, such a catast catastrophe as in 30, uh, in 93 and 95, and now we have the, again a crisis, but now in the secondary system. So uh, this, uh, the perception and realization of people who um, uh, um, experience this crisis, uh, this, the people also were brought up, were brought up with um, the, the, the realization we yeah, are safe for water, but we aren't safe for water. So left to their own devices, people might build back the same instead of better. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anne, I, could, do you have any thoughts or any comments on this? I saw you nodding pretty yeah. vigorously. Um, maybe just a little addition. Uh, it's good to know that our role, um, or the role of psychosocial managers in Belgium, lies mainly in the emergency response. So not necessarily um, in the in the prevention or the changing of risk perception uh, before that of course it's something that that we as a government are are thinking about really uh yeah, hard especially looking at, at what happened last year and then also after other events but we we see that the risk perception collective risk perception is as we know uh, influenced by a lot of things it can be individual characteristics, we see that people are much more likely to change their risk perception if they live in these areas. For instance, now we see that there's there's some change, but we also work on other calamities or, or collective disasters. A flood a village away has less of an impact than a terrorist attack. We see that the, the risk um, perception is, is different or the influence is different. And the government, and we have a big role in making sure that people get trustworthy information to make their risk perception be as, as, as aligned with the actual risk as possible. And that is something that we see, for instance, last year during the floods, that there are things that, that really went well, like the, the Belgian government really goes into um, a monitoring social media and seeing what the risk perception, what the concerns, what the difficulties are explained there and tries to respond to that. But in other ways, we didn't always do a great job in making sure that even within government or between different government structures, the risk perception was communicated in the same way. 
So you have to experience it. And Cornelia, is, is that your experience also? Um, first of all, hello together. Um, I would like to ask that those people that do not speak could mute their microphones because otherwise we would hear all these back and forth noises. It's very difficult to follow um, the speech. Um, I would like to say I'm not only a councilwoman of the county, Arweiler, I'm uh, the chief administrator elected by all the citizens. And maybe I would like to um, give some figures of our region and then come to this question of perception. Um, the, 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 the river R is uh, almost 90 kilometers long and um, has a drop in altitude of more than 450 meters. So within those almost 90 kilometers, it has the same drop as the river Rhine from the Lake of Constance up to the North Sea. And this means that this river is uh, getting very fast when there are high waters. We have had last year with this low Bernd, we had 134 deaths in this night and two people are still missing. 40 kilometers of the river have been destroyed and a lot of their backwaters too. 42,000 people have been affected by this flood. 9,000 houses are severely damaged or destroyed completely. And regarding um, the damage in, in uh, heart, uh, uh, in money, it's uh, around um, 33 uh, billion euros uh, in Germany. And alone of this sum in our region and the R Valley, it's about 15 billion euros of damage. And the municipal damage alone is 3 point or 3-8 three, uh, billion euros and around 3,000 individual measures. And this makes uh, it visible maybe what has happened in this very big area. And this is um, something to keep in mind. We are approaching um, the year date with all these dead people. And I've um, again thought about this thing of personal perception. There are, I think, some aspects that come into play. There's um, the right behavior is influenced by group behavior. Um, if you think about this thing of Corona and wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. Um, in Asia, it's very normal to wear a mask in public. And in Germany, for example, it was not thinkable to wear a mask in public before Corona came. And now um, the laws are um, not so tight anymore and you are not supposed to wear a mask outside in, in, in public with a lot of people. And when you have a crowd, you were, would very seldom see someone wearing a mask. And the same thing happens um, if you want to protect your property or your life. Another thing probably is um, the individual life experience um, and the own risk perception have a big influence on how to react and had a big influence how people reacted here last year. People living on a river are used to water and they have an idea from their own um, from their own life experience what water and a river and a flood at the river would mean. And we have had a, a, a flooding that was called a 100 year event five years ago. And people had an idea where the water would come in their houses. And so they were counting on this imagination. And um, what happened is they prepared for a 100 year flooding. And we had um, a water level that was about three times as high. And this is part of, of um, the, the personal awareness, how, how can you imagine something that is not imaginable? And this is uh, one of the big questions, how to prepare. And maybe um, it's the unthinkable, you don't have enough fantasy or the others say you have too much fantasy. 
Also, most of the experts here didn't have an idea that something like this, three times as high as a 100-year flooding, could happen. And uh, we know from people who died that night, they were in their houses, family members came, uh, firemen came, said, take your goods, let's go out, come back tomorrow. And they said, okay, five years ago, we had water just one hand up in the house. I would go to the first floor and I'm safe. I don't leave my house. And the water came into the second floor, took the roof off, destroyed the house and the person drowned. So this is individual risk perception. And maybe there's even one more point I would like to mention. Um, um, we have something that we call um, flooding dim um, de 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 dementia. You would, uh, when you have um, traumatic memory, you would hide this. You would not want to think about this. So you don't want to prepare for the next event. Maybe you do some preparation at the beginning, but after a year or two or three years, you would try to block this memory. And this is also a big influence, what we have seen after 2016. And we don't know now what would happen with this dimension between trauma and neglect of this memory. Junior, thank you. Um, Martin, perhaps you could add to some of that from and, and, and give us some insights into your personal experience on these sort of circumstances. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Uh, so we talk about uh, things that can enhance or um, undermine uh, the collective perception. Um, a lot of things are said. Um, I think um, one point is that um, not everyone is interested in disasters. So we heard it before, and it's a known problem um, that there are many more interesting things um, and urgent topics. So catastrophic events um, are raw, and the society depends on a functioning system. That means um, that um, the res responsibility um, for many areas of life that were transferred to institutions uh, and I think uh, that increasingly uh, abandoned one owns uh, capacity uh, to help ourselves in um, a catastrophe. Um, so I think we need to communicate uh, to the people um, what type of help they can expect in case of a disaster and um, what type of help uh, they don't have to expect. So I think that can undermine, and it's called the vulnerability paradox, so it can undermine um, the collective perception. So there are um, things that make can enhance uh, the perception. And I think uh, when we develop flood risk maps that integrates local knowledge, we have um, thousands of experiences along the river. R, and we should integrate this knowledge into uh, the flood risk maps. So usually flood risk maps um, in Germany, um, they are uh, for specialists, you need um, to, to work with these flood risk maps to understand these maps. Um, we should integrate local knowledge um, that is held by different community members. And uh, I think we can uh, consider or develop new explicit knowledge. Um, what can be disseminated through the community and then became a group level knowledge. So um, I think individual risk perception in this way uh, could enhance the collective perception. Um, we heard about, uh, or maybe we, talk, we don't talk about the cry wolf effect. So if um, someone's alert, alerting uh, when a flood comes in and it's uh, usually a minor flood, so the, the people or the confidence is reduced uh, from, from uh, through the early warning system. And that means, or is called the cry wolf effect and can undermine our risk perception. Um, the last point uh, to this question, um, I think um, one possibility to enhance the collective perception is to, to make drills, to make evacuation drills, um, to train together uh, with, the, um, with the people in the R Valley or in different other valleys in Belgium or in Netherlands. Um, and uh, that the uh, inhabitants feel like a part of the evacuation drill.
Okay, thank you. That's good. So that kind of, and, and all of you have touched on probably what we should move on to next, which are the kind of, um, what are the suitable or the most effective forms of risk reduction? Uh, what are the approaches that we can take to minimize the risks and to sort of share the knowledge, education more among communities? And do you have any um, thoughts on that? Well, I think it's it lies knowing whether whether something is suitable or effective. There, we need, of course, all these academics. We saw they're they're very well represented. So I think there's research. It's it's, it's so important to really know how to do it and, and what to give as a message. Um, in Belgium, I have the the honor with my colleagues to set up a center of expertise to make sure that we can translate knowledge on disasters, on the, for instance floods and especially from the psychosocial lens, how can we translate it in prevention, in education? In, so I think that is, is an important step. We have some, um, some community or some, uh, some educational disaster risk educational programs, like in, in the primary schools, we have programs, how to deal with disasters, how to prepare for floods. And I think those are very important. But also, like uh, like uh, my colleague here uh, was just saying, also making sure that you prepare your community for what they can expect and what they can't expect, and also what the what the larger emergency responses are. People do not know what they are, which makes it very scary at a time. Uh, for instance, when when a flood comes, people are very they feel left by the government. They say we've been sitting here for hours. Nobody comes. Really, nobody cares about it. Nobody is doing something, and also changing that narrative, knowing that, that there are plans in place um, can help. I think also not only looking at educa educating the community, but also educating professionals who come in, in contact with anybody who is a uh, victim or affected by a flood. We have so much knowledge on, for instance, the, the potential protective factor of social cohesion before, during, and after floods that, that will greatly decrease the impact of the floods. So informing people about that and helping people use that knowledge, both in the preventive and in the after. And, and, and is that what would help you, Patrick? Is that what you feel is? Uh, absolutely. And in addition to that, uh, during the crisis, and thank God we didn't have to, people who died uh, just like in Belgium or in Germany, but uh, it, it was almost fascinating that people were sitting on uh, the terraces and cafes and watching this nature event uh, coming through, um, seeing caravans, dixies floating by and living on their uh, beer, uh, people standing on dikes, these dikes getting saturated by water, so the, there was a risk of uh, collapsing uh, these dikes. And we told people, uh, get off of dikes, they can be saturated. And, a lot of them thought, well, was standing in state. We can see it, and when it is necessary, we go uh, go away. So this is it's, it's a fascinating system in, in the head of people why they don't see the the, the, the the risks which they are uh, facing. Um, I think another point is that people have an enormous um, I would say of power, confidence in the governments. The government state will take care for everything especially on water issues in the Netherlands. Uh, we, we, generations were brought up with uh, knowledge. The government take care of you. And, um, for my organization, the uh, Water Authority, we, we are now starting to communicate. We can do what we can, but there will be still a risk left. Uh, realize that and uh, ask yourself, uh, citizen of Falkenberg or wherever you live, what measurements can you take yourself? And therefore, we have several programs which we communicate in uh, smaller villages, in, in the town halls, uh, and so on. But it, it, it's uh, perhaps you can compare it with um, um, placing solar panels on your roofs. We started with it back 20, 25 years ago, and uh, there were only the early adapters which started with it, and now we are in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, leading number one in the world with the, with the most solar panels on, on the roofs. Uh, so it, it's, it, it is a movement of, of about uh, 10, 20, or 30 years before people realize that the world is changing. 
uh, and the last remark which I want to, uh, uh, to put out um, at the water authority, we are end of pipe. We are uh, end of pipe of the solutions which we create. Dikes are wonderful and give the river uh, its space back as we do here, as we did here in Maastricht or in the Nimhagen, uh, are perfect examples how you uh, collaborate with nature, not work against uh, nature. But the bigger issue is um, uh, realizing uh, that we as uh, as a kind, as a species, uh, have an enormous effect on the, the climate change. And that is a very big issue. It's very far away from people. So we always try to make it small, to tell people, look in your own circle of influence, what can you do? So put those solar panels on your roof. Start with those Jack it up out, heat pumps. So uh, the, the, the make from your home not an, um, an area with, which needs uh, energy, but which produces energy. And something small like measurements which you take for too much water are also good for when there is a uh, drought. So uh, um, uh, your drain pipe, cut it not through the sewage, but just in your car. Put trees about your home, don't put air in your home. So uh, we, uh, these are not issues which, uh, which we are as a water authority responsible for, but we are communicating about these is, uh, issues to make those big mondial issues small. And it, it gives you also a good feeling. I can do something in my own garden, in my own house. That's, that's nice. That's very nice. I'm going to come to the audience in a moment. So if you have any points or questions, then please be ready. Martin, are you hearing things here that you think would help people on the ground? Property is important. The lives are more important. Um, how would people react and respond to some suggestions that you're hearing? Okay, first of all, I think uh, we have to define risk um, to understand um, the possibilities. So um, risk is an intersection. Um, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Um, I think risk is an intersection of vulnerability, of exposure against the flood and the danger. So we have to do, and we heard it at the keynote at the beginning, uh, that we have to make a flood risk assessment. We need to know what happened um, about the last 200 years. Um, what is the difference between the flood 2016, a sentinel flood in 2021? Um, and we should understand um, disaster risk reduction as an ongoing task um, that should be aimed against forgetting. It's, I think, a really important part. Um, so I can't give um, any any uh, tips what what is to do better, but I think um, um, I'm connected with different scientists from different countries at the moment, and um, there are a few ideas. So um, referring to the emergency service, I think we need um, uh, a resilient uh, early warning structure. So we need emergency planning, as I said before, with um, interactive flood maps, I think. Um, we need the right tools to, to rescue people. When we talk about risk, um, it is um, not clear where the next flood will start. It can be in Germany, it can be in Belgium or Netherlands, and we need the right tools to evacuate people. So um, in the background, you see a helicopter. We need uh, helicopters and hoist, and we need trained persons. So um, I think that the main factor in decision making is um, are the human beings that are doing decisions. So we need education and we need to make um, things that are not imaginable. We, we heard it from Cornelia Weigand that um, should be imaginable and we should use new technologies uh, for training. So um, in, in my sector, the air rescue service, so we talk about errors, um, human errors every day, because one error means that an helicopter uh, crashes, crashes. So I think we can learn um, for disaster management from the air rescue service. So that's one part. Um, for the recovery, we heard it before, we should build back better, but um, I think it's it's a big problem. Uh, wine growers within their livelihoods um, should build up new houses in a different position, um, but everything, the tourism uh, depends on on this connection of wine growers of this river. So it's, it's really difficult. <clears throat> and the last part. Okay. Okay, do you have another point? It's okay. Um, so, so the last last point is um, um, no, that's it. Sorry. <laughs> okay, that's it. There's a question. I'm. I don't want to neglect the online audience, but there's a question there, Martin. How do you see 
uh, this is from Dick Kohler, uh, how do you see the military civil cooperation during the event? So yesterday I was near Hannover um, um, together with the military, with the search and rescue command, um, and um, it works well. So my first, my first sighting flight uh, through the Arbele was uh, the 15th of July, uh, together with the military, um, and it, it works really, really well. Okay, that's it. Any points from the floor in the room? Does anyone have any questions? Or... Okay. I'll... If you just use this microphone. If you Okay, one question to you, Cornelia Weigand. What do you suggest for other archive values to take away from this event, especially from the experience and what you now know what could be done better? This is one general question. And specifically, such as the R Valley, the, we are quite fortunate in, in Europe to have time series of sufficient length to calculate the one and one hundred year flood. Yet, uh, such as the R Valley, we have learned that assessment of historic floods might maybe is essential to incorporate that when designing flood maps and so on. So, how do you think this should be going forward? Also for other valleys. So, what can we learn? And could you just say briefly who you are? I'm Jordan Murma from Hanover. Thank you. Cornelia? Um, I will try my best. Uh, I, I think um, I don't have uh, solutions, not at least not plentiful solutions. I have impressions. I don't have enough time to correspond with the scientific branches from different areas to condense enough of this. But I would like to give you some ideas on this. Uh, um what what can other regions learn from our regions uh, one thing of course is to 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 try to think the unthinkable to make sure that everything you do is not enough uh, for the, the the bigger risk um we have had good plans well, for the region where i am up to the the um 200 year risk of flooding and this is what the, the, the firearm man did do to work on these plants. And these plants still didn't have half of the, the height of the water. So try to think the unthinkable. Try to imagine, get down the priorities, saving lives, saving properties, uh, which means uh, that you have to think about evacuation routes, that you have to think about means of reaching people at that night which means re redundant systems, um, systems that work without um, electricity, that have buffering systems. Um, this topic of cell broadcasting, so you can push um, information to people and be aware this is not enough. At least in Germany, there are many places where cell broadcasting doesn't work because there is no um, reception of any mobile signals in this place. So think about sirens, uh, which have been put down in Germany ages ago. Um, this thing of education is, I think, very important to get back risk education uh, to the schools. Uh, one, of course, uh, also looking into historic floods is, is very important. Not only uh, since your measurement is very precise, uh, we have seen that there is a big difference between um, taking um, um, uh, I forgot, taking the, the the gorge values into account and taking um, really rain measurement uh, in this big area into account. There was a misreception uh, of how much water actually reached the the the, the area of the. Um, the river, because mostly the, the data came from, from measurements of the gorge in the river, and that is too late, because once the water is in the river, um, you have lost maybe an hour, maybe two hours, maybe three hours. And with these rivers that are steep, with these valleys that are steep, you don't have time. Time is your most precious moment. And when the river is there, and when the water is there, 
the, the velocities are so high, there is almost no chance to help. You had single people that were able to go into these fast running rivers because they have very special training. But if you have like 30, 40,000 people that are in danger, two people, three people who can help, that's a problem. And maybe this is a problem of Germany. This federal structure is not very helpful. The river doesn't care about borders. The river uh, or the water doesn't care about borders. The water takes uh, um, gravity. And so it just comes down the valleys, down, down the hills. And um, it's very important that, the, that there's a professional structure also. And in Germany, we don't have a professional watchfulness for, for natural catastrophes with uh, terror events. That's normal that you always have an idea where um, uh, people that are a danger to society would, would be what they are planning. But with uh, natural catastrophes, there is not um, a professional team watching and getting the forces into work. One, one of the big problems for us also was um, the normal ad ad administrative possibilities are not enough to cope. And there was no commu communication to, to make sure that the, the armed forces would send their helicopters. There is no communication and the armed forces need to get, uh, let's say, an invitation. Here is really a difficult, dangerous situation. We need your help. When the situation comes so fast that you cannot send this help cry, there is no help because they are not allowed to come. And this is something that happened to us. I tried to make my superiors do this cry. They didn't do it. And we have lost a lot of people. And this is also maybe some, 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 some part to realize you don't have much time. So you need a very good, powerful way to, to, um, to react on the situations with all the other aspects that we have heard before, with education, with meditation, with um, consciousness about what could happen with education of the young people, with education and training of the adults. And um, also what I would wish from um, scientific side, I think there's a lot of um, good studies, good reports uh, explaining how to best educate um, the, the citizens, how to best um, think about evacuation routes, plans, but there is not much transfer from science to administration. It's difficult to have uh, different uh, study reports and think about what is best for your region. It would be um, very, from my side, a, a big wish to, to come closer to um, structures that we can break down and make them happen in our regions. Okay. And I guess this is important to think about this in your valley. Think the unthinkable in your valley and ask also your universities around them what are good concepts from science? Let's try to break them down to our region before something happens. Okay, good. Uh, Cornelia, thank you. Uh, Patrick, you have something to add? Yes. Um, uh, um, I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to explain that uh, yesterday we presented um, um, an early warning system across borders with Belgium and with Germany. So we are working together. It's very good. And, uh, and I once was told the best prevention of a crisis is preventing this crisis. Um, uh, uh, and what I want to say with this, the, the real issue is rural planning. Uh, uh, when you look at the Aarau, I saw um, yesterday uh, a documentary uh, on my laptop. It was uh, uh, several weeks ago. But, uh, there was found out the Romans in the Aarau uh, they put their buildings 20 meters uh, higher than uh, the art tower. But we as humans were thinking we can build everywhere. Uh, I mean, and we can mine out uh, our earth uh, as it is uh, uh, waste. Uh, so um, rural planning is essential, but how do we behave to, to the earth? We have to uh, care for the earth, not to mine the earth. That is the bigger issue. It's, it's a bit uh, 
uh, spherical, or how, how do you say it in English, uh, as a statement? That is the real issue. How do we, uh, um, as human beings, uh, act towards nature? Should we work against nature? We should work uh, with nature. Uh, so, are, are there lessons here for the floods, for other uh, extreme weather events and disasters from collective action that we saw around COVID? And it's been touched on already. Um, yeah. Are there, do you have any thoughts, Patrick or Anne? Yeah, you see. May, may I very fastly um, get another idea to what uh, you've just said? Okay, of course, it's, it's, yep. it's, it's, it's very important uh, from uh, the, the moment today into future to plan and not only to plan on a local level, but to plan on a regional municipal level, on a broader level and to, to get risk perception into the planning. But yeah. um, the other thing is what um, you have a, um, an actual situation, uh, how the buildings look like, how the villages look like at this moment. And it's not possible to change completely and it's not possible to get all people out of the valleys onto the hills and the mountains. That doesn't work in Europe. So from, from now on for the future, it's, very, it's not very easy, but it's, it's, it's uh, feasible and you have to work with nature. But you also have to, to, to develop good concepts to, to cope with the actual situation and be realistic. And I think this is also important, this from science to the village to be realistic. Otherwise, you would lose the people and nothing, nothing changes. Okay, that's good. So then are there lessons from COVID on this or is that just a, not, is that a kind of false comparison? Well, I, I think the comparison is a bit... Um... Yeah, you can always make comparisons, but I think the situations are, are very different. But looking, for instance, at the at the community action, the volunteering that, that we saw after COVID, um, thinking about that, I think we saw a lot of that as well after the floods, at least in Belgium. The surge in, in volunteering and in, in just very spontaneous volunteering was enormous. Um, I think we saw it from the very early start, we saw it the region was also so vast, so a lot of the, the regions, a lot of parts in the region were not um, yet reached by the, by the official response. So I think there, there's a lot of similarities in how people stood up to volunteer to support those affected. And I think we can learn a lot from COVID in the sense that there we had a lot more structure in the volunteering. Um, now we had a lot of very spontaneous volunteering, which comes with a lot of good energy, but it also comes with some, some pitfalls. Like we saw that, that a lot of people were, there was a lot of vicarious trauma as well. A lot of the volunteers found themselves in very difficult situations and they, they go home with a lot of emotional and psychological damage because they were not prepared for what they saw. We saw that there also a lot of the volunteering is often short-lived. People want to do something or, or it goes in all directions that not necessarily respond to the need. And I think there, there is a lot we can learn from the COVID volunteering is that we need to bolster and foster that, that, that enormous um, yeah, energy, good volunteering energy, making sure that it, it's not, not too structured but still that we, that we support that volunteering effort, because I think, especially if you talk to people in the region, if they say, what do we get out of it? There's not only bad things, it's also the solidarity, the feeling that people, especially in a Belgian very complex context, that a lot of people from Flanders came to the French speaking part. If you, in each interview, you can see that coming. Okay, and, that's, and the, I guess the point about time is interesting because Bizarrely, in some ways, to Emilio's point, that there was a little bit of time in COVID. When the flood come, when the floods come, they come, and that's it. And Martin, the talk of time, we are actually almost out of time. Martin, do you have anything to add to this part of the conversation? Just a final comment. Okay. Um, first of all, to I would like to to answer to the last question from the um, from the from the viewers. <clears throat> so, what what tips um, are or what can we learn from from the Avali? I think um, if your region um, haven't had a flood in the last year, so take a look at your history. So I started this way uh, five years ago uh, with the Sentinel flood and again 
2021 uh, with support from the University of Bonn uh, to get um, a feeling for discharge volumes that run um, down the river and destroy houses and pro produces impact. So look in your local history and you can learn from these seldom or rare events. And uh, so the aim is to, to develop mission profiles for the future. So we need to understand the unimaginable and um, therefore you have to look in the past. Another point from my point of view, from the aerial view is that we get forecasts um, and the forecast says, okay, what the weather will be. So wine growers and um, in our region, we know uh, when um, outside that it's raining, rain comes, but we need to know um, um, impact forecast. We need to know um, what the weather will destroy. So then we can react. Okay, thank you. Patrick, any final comments? Uh, no, <laughs> that's fine. That's a, so look, I th thank you um, to Patrick and Anne and Martin and Amelia. Um, it's the first plenary. We are out of time now, but at least I think that there are many, many issues come up in this conversation that we can continue over coffee and in the sessions to follow uh, today and tomorrow. So the ne next, after the coffee break, uh, here in the main hall is the session on lessons from 2021 and the emergency response and coordination uh, session will be 1B down the stairs. So uh, I just want to thank our speakers and thank you for your questions and engagement and uh, look forward to chatting over coffee. Thank you.